Chief, you're recognized on Proclamation 1405. Thank you, Chairman Woodson. Uh, proclamation 1405 is our Wildlife Management Area Proclamation. It is our biggest proclamation. I, we have 120 different areas in which we set the hunting seasons on. To simplify things and to make it more uh, simplified and, and available to the public, we try to recommend statewide seasons as much as possible so those folks that do not have private land to hunt on um, can go and enjoy the same seasons that everyone else does. Uh, what I will do is just try to run through as quickly as possible the major changes that took place in the WMA proclamation. If you look at the beginning section, we do have an area in which we designate uh, some statewide rules and regulations regarding WMAs, and one of the additions or recommendations this year t was to ban the release of pen-raised, pen-reared upland birds on our WMAs. We do have two of them that traditionally have run field trials, and that is Percy Priest and Teleco, and we wanted to grandfather those WMAs in, but prevent the release of pen-reared upland game birds on all the other WMAs. That takes us to all the different regions. The proclamation is broke, broken up into uh, the four different regions, or at least how we present this. Region one, which is West Tennessee, these are the general changes that occurred or recommendations that occurred, uh, expanding uh, some deer, uh, removing the restriction on, on archery hunting in Berkeley, um, changing some of the time restrictions on Bogota and Horns Bluff. Uh, um, significant change was on Gooch, Meeman, Shelby, and White Oak. We we're going to uh, create these computerized draw for waterfowl blinds to reduce some of the pressure and conflicts in those areas. On John, John Tully, we were going to restrict the harvest of antlerless deer and do a handheld draw for the waterfowl blinds. Uh, Thorny Cypress had a change to the new walk-in waterfowl area. Uh, we were adding a dove hunt on White Oak. And on Wolf River, we were going to close quail hunting and add a spring youth turkey hunt. The reason we are adding quail hunting is we have kicked off our quail operational plan. Uh, that is progressing well. We are we have selected four focus areas in the state of Tennessee, one in each region, and Wolf River is the focus area in, in region one. Uh, also in region one, there were some changes in the turkey hunting um, in those, those counties that we consider the floodplain. Um, we, we are also creating some quota hunts on this upper Obion River complex, and more or less what it, what it calls for is if you get drawn for one of those quota hunts, it allows you to uh, hunt to hunt a couple of different WMAs under that same permit. We've never done that before, but that's spelled out in the proclamation. Um, and, and this continues on with those, those quota turkey hunts in Region 1. In Region 2, which is, encompasses Middle Tennessee and where we sit right now, uh, there weren't too many changes. Uh, we're, we had some additional regulations for Headwaters, which is a new WMA we proclaimed last year. And on Laurel Hill, due to concerns about the turkey population, we do recommend closing the fall turkey season on Laurel Hill. In Region 3, which primarily consists of our Cumberland Plateau counties, we had a couple of recommendations. Uh, we we're going to liberalize the small game seasons on Hawassi Refuge, as well as add a spring youth turkey hunt on Yuchi. Uh, again, we're going to close the quail season on a focus area. Bridgestone Firestone is the uh, quail focus area for Region 3, uh, but we're also recommending closing the season on Catoosa, Chickamauga, Cordell Hill, and Keys Harrison. Reason being, there are not many birds on those areas to hunt, and what few birds we have left, uh, we want to make sure that we, we save those birds. And last but not least is Region 4, which is far eastern Tennessee. And the recommendations we have in Region 4, uh, David Sams is not here, but uh, we are going to open some summer coyote opportunities on Chuck Swan, as well as um, doing some restrictions on North Cumberland regarding the deer and turkey seasons. There is some concern with the populations there. Uh, we are also going to recommend blaze orange requirements by small game hunters during big game seasons on Foothills, Henderson Island, Kiker Bottoms, Kyle's Fjord, Lick Creek Bottoms, and 
That is it for the for the uh, all the WMA recommend, recommendations that we presented last month. The one thing I wanted to do is to let you know that during the course of the season setting process, that particular proclamation is very detailed. There's there's many regulations on each and every one of these WMAs, and once in a while we we tweak it because we find an error that we didn't catch the first time we presented it to you. And I just wanted to let you know that we, we found the following and I wanted to advise you of them so you didn't think we were trying to slip something in on you. One of the things that uh, came to our attention after we presented this in April was a recommendation to close Kings, Kingston Refuge to hunting. Um, if I might invite one of the region two just to explain that, that recommendation, or region three. We operate uh, Kingston Refuge in conjunction with TBA. It's TBA controlled property, so we work very tightly with them on establishing these hunts. Uh, we met with the uh, area man or the their plant manager, uh, who is uh, new to that office. But anyway, he is a hunter. Uh, but he brought concerns that there's a lot of construction going on the TBA property at Kingston Refuge. Uh, so we was he wasn't sure exactly the amount of area that would be able to hunt this year. And he also raised a second issue, which was there are some huge uh, ammonia tanks in the vicinity of the, the hunt zone. And he was uh, concerned about being able to get our hunters out if there was an ammonia leak. Uh, there, TVA is gonna work on those problems for next year. And he's, like I said, he is a hunter and he was really very apologetic in recommending that he wanted to the season to be closed or these hunts to be closed for this year. So we are optimistic that in the next year that we'll be able to get back and continue our hunting program on Kingston Refuge. Thank you. Another adjustment that we found uh, after we presented the recommendations in April, we attended a, a, a meeting in conjunction with uh, Cherokee National Forest to go over the, the management plans. Uh, it's a great working relationship we have with TWRA and the U.S. Forest Service. And it was brought to my attention after the meeting that I had one of the, the opening dates wrong on the raccoon season in South Cherokee. Uh, we originally had it in there as opening on January 2nd when it should have opened January 3rd. Uh, you may see some changes in the verbiage. None of the quota hunts, none of the season dates, none of the... Uh, none of the intent changed regarding the, the turkey quota hunts in West Tennessee, but we had to change some of the verbiage to make it more uh, legal savvy. So there was some verbiage changes there. Uh, we also came to find out just a few days ago that LBL <coughs> had a change to their spring turkey season. Uh, they were running a survey that is actually still ongoing right now, and they were trying to accommodate the, the wishes and desires of the hunters at LBL. and. Uh, I need to thank Steve Blomer there. He analyzed the survey before it was actually complete to make sure we had the recommendation in, in time for today. But we, those changes have been reflected. And the, the one thing, and this wasn't in the WMA proclamation, it was actually in the National Wildlife Refuge proclamation. We originally closed Big South Fork uh, to bear hunting in the National Wildlife Refuge proclamation. Since we never opened it up there, it was probably not the best place to put it. And so we, we move that to the big game proclamation. But that uh, concludes all the recommendations to the wildlife management area proclamation, which is proclamation 1405. Thank you. And we'll go ahead and if, if it uh, will, works for everybody, go ahead and get it properly before us with a motion and the second, and then we'll take discussion. Is there a motion? Make a motion by Commissioner right. Bledsoe, second by Commissioner Cox. Questions, Commissioner Baker. Can you tell me about the pen raised birds again? Um, where we're allowed to have them, where we're not? Uh, the, the restriction would be on all WMAs in the state of Tennessee not to allow the release of pen raised birds on those public lands. This does nothing for the release of pen raised birds on private lands, but on, on our lands, there's been enough research to show that it could have a negative impact on the wild quail. And since we're going to be focusing our efforts with our quail plan to try to do much better things for quail and hopefully uh, um, restore some of those populations, especially in, in those focus areas and those anchor WMAs, the release of pen raised birds may be detrimental to that uh, management. 
and so we were going to, um, we recommend not allowing the release of pen raised birds on our WMAs. The two that uh, you asked about, one was Percy Priest, in which we have a uh, historic field trial area, as well as Teleco, which I believe they also have a field trial area, what about, Teleco Lake. What about Hawassi? We do not have an established, if, if I could call on. I'm Kirk Miles, I'm the wildlife program manager in uh, region three. Um, is your question, do we have, would this apply to Hawassi Refuge? Yes. The answer would be yes, as it currently is written that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to release <coughs> any upland game birds on Hawassi. We would still be able to release, uh, Hawassi has a, uh, the main field trials that Jason has there, he's the area manager of waterfowl. He would still be able to, since that's not an upland game bird, those field trials Jason would still be able to, to have as he's had in the past. Right, but the, with, with the way it's written now, we couldn't use pheasants. That's true. Ooh. Yes, sir. That would be my dis that would be my point. Can we talk about that a little bit in terms of the areas that do have field trials that yes, use different types of, of game and if it would be appropriate to consider an exception? I think, one, I want to thank the agency for its flexibility with the uh, Percy Priest uh, property. That was a direct reaction to the folks who were field trialing on those properties. And so pheasants are actually, particularly for folks who are trying to get to nationals, um, <laughs> pheasants are an important part of trying to compete fairly with folks from all over the country and so wonder what kind of openness or considerations the agency might have for allowing that exception. I, I know in Region 3, um, Teleco Lake is in particular, we, they've historically had field trials there and, and the, actually David Whitehead, the manager, manages a lot of the area for field trials. You know, he, he tailors his management two field trials. The other, primarily the only other two that we really have field trial request would be Hiawassee Refuge um, and probably Uchi Refuge. Some maybe on Uchi. Um, and the way those work, the, you know, we get a request 30 days in advance and we approve them and all that, all that good stuff. So it's not, field trials are not happening. My point I'm trying to make is field trials really aren't happening on all of our management areas. It's really specific management areas that we get the request for. If, if sportsmen were training for retriever field trials, as an example, yes. and were shooting pheasants as part of that practice, under, would under, this be prohibited under this proposal? Yes, ma'am, it would. Would it, would it, I, I'm asking if there's be a consider, is there a problem if we exempt? How about we throw this out? Um, after discussion with, with, with our staff, uh, we could change it, instead of upland game birds, we could change it to quail. Well, the only thing about, the only. Commissioner Baker, yes, sir. I'm sorry. The only thing about that is, I mean, I'm a, of course, me and Commissioner Woodson are field trialers with our labs, but there's also field trialers out there with their, with their bird dogs, too, and I sure hate to, uh, just like I would hate to hinder the, the bear hunters or anybody else that, or the beagle hunters with the rabbits. I'd, um, I'd really be, I mean, maybe there's, maybe you dictate 10 or 15 areas that you would love to get the quail populations going in. I, I don't want to not bring quail back by any means whatsoever, but at the same time, there's a whole lot of people that sure enjoy spending the outdoors with their dogs and training their dogs, and lots of times, they're doing it on uh, state-owned properties that, that they live in a subdivision or something. They don't have the opportunity to be able to go, or don't own their own private property to be able to go train their dogs, on. be my opinion. Commissioner Cox? Darrell, I, I, I certainly don't intend to put you on the spot, but since you and I attended the, that meeting last week, and I wanna, I'll talk about that in a minute, is the, is the uh, resistance to Pen raised birds, a, a something that you suspect might harm the birds, or you know it will. And the second part of that question is, based on what the biologists have told me, is 
putting getting the quail back on the landscape is probably not going to happen. So even if the pin raised birds were were out there, they're probably not going to live past a year. What is it really going to hurt? And then I've got other I've got something else to follow up with that in a minute. There have been some studies now. Now keep in mind our agency is focused on the resource, which this resource is the wild quail on the landscape. And there have been some studies that showed the release of pen-raised birds um, could have some negative implications. Although the disease factor might not come into play, the genetic dilution, the, the unfortunate thing is pen-raised pen birds do not survive. They've lost a lot of their instincts. And so if they start breeding with wild birds, those wild birds that we're trying to save become more vulnerable and again, they, it just decreases the wild bird's chance to survive. And that's why we wanted to do whatever we can to make sure that the wild birds that we're trying to restore have every, uh, the, the greatest opportunity and chance of survival. And so the release of, of pen raised birds might reduce their survivability. Could we not do this on just the quail focus areas instead of all the WMAs? And I know that's a, that's not the proposal, so I guess that's a suggestion for the commission. Uh, and while, I'm, while I've got the floor, I was invited to speak last week at a uh, National Bird Dog Museum about quail. Well, I accepted, and then they told me it was about quail, and that was a trap. So I called, uh, and Daryl came down and spoke to this group and did a magnificent job, and he drove down on Saturday drove back on Saturday night and did a great job and I really publicly want to thank him for for doing that he did a great job uh, and following up on that director Carter this group is a, a bird dog training uh, field trial training group and there's it's an international group this is region six well they some of the suggestions they had were designated areas that they could train their dogs Arkansas has got two or three, Mississippi's got two or three, and if it doesn't interfere with hunters, I don't know why we couldn't have one somewhere, and I thought, I didn't promise them anything, obviously, but I thought maybe I'd request that you might talk to the Arkansas director and Dr. Polis in Mississippi and see, get a little information on those things, and, and talking in the budget about out of the box, they do charge these people to professionals and amateurs to train their dogs, and it might be a, it might not be a lot of money, but it might be some. So I thought, would you please do a little research on that and find out if that's what, how they do that and what problems they have and that kind of thing. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Cannon. How many? <clears throat> How many WMAs right now do we have field trials taking place on? Um, in Region 3, we have Teleco Lake WMA, which yes. has two units, McGee Carson and the Chody unit. Both of those units, we, we have field trials. On Percy Priest Wildlife Management Area in Region 2, yes, they have field trials. Now in Region 3, we, we do have field trial requests and have field trials. I know on Hiawassee Refuge, and I'm fairly certain we've had a few on Uchi that would be similar to, to Hiawassee. They're, you know, that's a waterfowl primarily. Hiawassee may have, Commissioner Baker, does, are you aware, does Hiawassee have a upland? Okay. I don't know that they have an upland. Yes, sir. There. I don't know that. I know they upland have field. retriever. Mm -hmm. uh, the East, East, I think it's the East Tennessee Retriever Club has yes, field trials two or three on Hiawassee. And the Chattanooga Retriever Club. Yes, sir. All right. Where, that, that may be the one I'm trying to think yes. of. Yeah. And it was this weekend and it was fabulous. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, our commissioner, I think she carried some ribbons home uh, nice. this weekend. Nice. I'm sorry to interrupt. Dialogue here. Oh, oh, I apologize. Mushy, mushy. <laughs> but basically, in, basically, on Teleco Lake WMA and Percy Priest, we have historically had field trials, and 
I think Percy Priest is like Teleco where we, we tailor our on the ground management to field trials. Um, Hawassi, we, you know, have field trials there as well. So Can, it's very limited probably. Uh, and, and, and that's part of my question and, and keep me straight here. Is there any reason, uh, go ahead. With that said, you know, actually, I suppose that any re any group could request a field trial on any of our management areas. I don't. I just don't. We just don't get the request. Is there any reason why we can't exclude? Uh, I'm hearing four WMAs in total. It's, it's well, uh, two on Teleco, Hawassi, and Percy Priest. We'll let Alan address Region okay. One. Okay. I don't think I've gotten any requests for upland game field trials. We get them all the time for raccoon field trials and, and rabbit field trials. And we've got uh, Horns Bluff, they, they throw a bunch of dead ducks for retriever field trials, but the dead ducks tend not to dilute the gene pool, so we don't care. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the quail, we, we don't get, we don't get any requests for, for quail field trials that I'm aware of, although I, I'd be, I'd be, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn for my guys. I don't think any of, any of my WMA managers want carte blanche for people to turn loose pin-reared quail on any of our areas, period. Can, my, my question, and, and please bear with me because I'll kind of fumble through this, but I'm hearing Basically, for the concern being expressed up here, there's four WMAs. Is there any reason why quail could not be used on those four WMAs uh, as part of pre-approved TWRA field trials taking place on those properties? Is there any You're detriment about to the pen-reared birds on those for field trials? Yes, sir. Uh, is there any detriment to what we're trying to accomplish? And you're, you're talking to the dummy here. If we had a flat piece of sand like the Sahara, I'd be all for it. But anywhere that there's quail habitat, I just really am reticent about turning loose pinnered birds for the reasons Daryl mentioned. Accidental introduction of diseases, artificially raising predator populations by feeding a bunch of dumb birds to stuff that can kill them and eat them and raise more babies to eat more quail. Uh, all the stuff that pinnered birds might do to damage a wild quail population, we don't have an area that we want to just sacrifice. That's an opinion. I can't prove that. Speaking that it'll of those, specifically those four WMAs, is that applicable? Um, obviously, the two of those WMAs, um, Teleco and Percy Priest, we, that would, I think we would, that, well, I, the proclamation already would allow that. Um, on Hawassi and Uchi, um, I I would some I know it was uh, the staff offered up um, just not the release of quail, uh, and I guess that's what your question is. And I'm kind of like Alan, to be honest, Commissioner Cannon. I, you know, I think if we th we do have some wild populations on those areas, and and I don't. I don't want to do anything that would threaten those populations. I also think that there's something to be said that, you know, if we're, if we are setting an example to folks that maybe want to manage wild quail populations on their property, you know, this is something that, that we shouldn't be doing on our WMAs. One last question, going back okay. to Commissioner Baker's point. Would pheasant be acceptable on those Yes, sir. On the, on the two yes, sir. WMAs. I, I'm, a, you know, I agree with the change from, from all upland game birds to quail only. That works. Um, so, you know, I don't think pheasant or would be a threat. I think we could live with that. Is there perhaps a motion for an amendment? I, I, it would, you saying that, I'd like to propose an amendment. I'll keep me honest here, okay, Kirk? <laughs> okay. I'd like to propose an amendment to the proclamation as presented to where only quail would be excluded from these, pen raised quail would be excluded from the WMAs that there aren't already exclusions on in this proclamation. 
That sounds correct to me. Is that? I'll yes, second. Sir. Motion by Commissioner Cannon, second by Commissioner Teague. Is there discussion from the commission on this amendment? Any discussion from the public? All those in favor of the amendment to the proclamation say aye. 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 Opposed, no. You adopt. We're back on the proclamation. Further discussion? Any discussion from the public? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second on Proclamation 1405. All of those in favor of Proclamation 1405 say aye. 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 Opposed, no. You adopt. We'll go to full commission. This brings us to Proclamation 1406, which is the National Wildlife Refuge Regulations. And since we have removed the, the mention of the no bear hunting in Big South Fork, pretty much this entire proclamation is simple date adjustments on all national wildlife refuges. Uh, the this hunting seasons on these areas are dictated and requested by the federal uh, agents, and we usually just uh, go with what they recommend. And so this year it was just simple date changes. And that concludes the National Wildlife Refuge recommendations. We have Proclamation 1406. Is there a motion on Proclamation 1406? Moved Second. by Commissioner Bledsoe, seconded by Commissioner Cox. Discussion? Any discussion from the public or feedback? I got a question. Daryl, do you know what the what a Friday opener would do for the uh, hours on the turkey hunting on the refuge? Is it in the proclamation? I'm not sure what the opening date it says. For the NWR proc? Yeah. Do we set the seasons on that or do the, do the, do the U.S. Fish and Wildlife do that? They, they, they advise us of the seasons we want and I, th I think you make it official, but um, I don't recall any time where, where any changes were made. Uh, so what's their what recommended requested. opening for turkey season? Uh, they usually say same as statewide. Okay. Uh, if, if they don't have statewide, then they just have specific dates for hunting. Any further discussion on 1406? Hearing none, all those in favor of Proclamation 1406 say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt. It will go to full commission. Proclamation 1408. Chief. Proclamation 1408 is a proclamation redefining, redefining Rankin Wildlife Management Area. Uh, it's simply some clerical work to redefine the boundaries of that area. I won't go through the um, gesture of reading the entire thing, but it's simply to redefine the, the boundaries of Rankin Wildlife Management Area according to the existing property lines. Move approval 1408. Motion on 1408 by Commissioner Cox, second by Commissioner McMillan. Discussion? Any discussion from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor of Proclamation 1408 say aye. aye. Opposed, no, you adopt. Goes to full commission. Proclamation 1407. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the commission. Um, for you to present the manner and means proclamation, we went over it last month. Uh, Fairly minor changes uh, of a house cleaning nature for the most part. I'll go through and that's not the right one. Where'd you? That's why move me. Okay. That's better. Thank you. Page one, just minor house cleaning. Uh, and we get over on page three. After the last commission meeting, we had a request from an individual that was having some trouble with harassment on trapping. So we added something uh, to address that. We added number seven down there that allows trappers to, says trappers shall mark all of their traps with their name or TWA ID number. That's the same thing that we've done uh, with uh, jugs and trot lines and whatever, so felt like it's appropriate to let them use their ID number the, rather than having put their name on there. Uh, on page 
four. We've had some fairly minor changes to answer some of the public requests on big game check-in. Uh, one of the issues we ran into last year with some of the changes we'd made uh, was people cutting up deer and whatever and putting them in coolers with no way to determine what they were. So we've added that the evidence of the animal sex species and antler status to actual must remain with the animal while afield. Then we had a re request from an individual that's wanting to do some backcountry bear hunting last year and was worried, concerned about dragging a whole bear out or a field dress bear. Uh, we have a regulation that requires a bear to be 75 pounds. So it's sort of a compromise regulation to address uh, all the concerns. We have added that they can bone out a bear, but they've got to, all the parts have to equal or exceed 75 pounds in the process. So that should address some of their concerns and uh, for the bears that really needing to do that. And then we added a section down there concerning uh, providing false information in the checkout process. That was an issue that came up as well last year with some of the changes we have made. In section seven in the miscellaneous, we have amended number one and added a section in there dealing with vessels to address uh, questions we always get and maybe an area we had not properly addressed over the years. Uh, when hunting is allowed from vessels, it's legal to hunt from any vessels as long as the vessel is not under forward motion from any influence from mechanical means or sail. That's what we've been telling folks for years. And then on private property, it's legal to hunt from any motorized vehicle to include ATVs, golf carts, et cetera, <coughs> providing the vehicle is stationary. Nothing in its section shall be construed as authorizing hunting from a vessel, automobile, or other motor vehicle while under power. Nothing in this subsection permits hunting from or across a public road or right away. Basically, this opens up for all vehicles rather than the uh, non-licensable vehicles as it was before. And then we address the issue for the bear hunters to continue, be able to continue to eradicate wild hogs on bear hunts, uh, even if they killed a bear. So with that, that's the recommendations for it. We have to answer any questions. We go ahead and get the proclamation before us. Um, is there a motion on 1407? Moved by Commissioner Mellon, seconded by Commissioner Teague. And we're on the proclamation discussion, members. I hate to do it. I know it's late. <laughs> Would you talk me through, quickly, quickly talk me through the miscellaneous section on the hunting and vehicle question? Okay. And, and As it stands right now, a hunter can use a UTV or an ATV as long as it's stationary as a blind and hunt out of it. However, it was illegal, or is illegal at this time, to use a truck, car, or whatever. Basically, you're using the things in the same method. You have to be stationary, and it's got to be able to be used as a blind. So if I have a UTV, a, Ford, a Polaris Ranger or whatever, I can pull it into the edge of the field, and I can sit there, and I can deer hunt out of it and be legal. If I don't have that, all I've got is a pickup truck. It's illegal for me to do the same thing with my pickup truck. Nothing allows either one of them to be riding around and shooting whatever. They've got to be stationary. So all this does is open it up for vehicles that can be licensed for the road. Okay. Any further discussion on 1407? There are no stupid questions. Yeah. Commissioner. Are engines running or off? Stationary. So, uh, so the heater works when you're sitting still. And 
I'm going to be in silent protest on this one, <laughs> folks. I do not get it. But yes, sir, Commissioner Cox. I didn't have anything. I was ready to call the question. Okay, question's been called. Is there any objection to the question? Oh, I apologize. Public comment. My apologies. Would anybody like to comment? Okay, then. Back on it. All those in favor of 1407, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You adopt. I'll go to full commission.